If you study medieval buildings closely enough, a quiet contradiction appears. Boards that should have warped, split, or softened under centuries of damp air, smoke, and seasonal cold are still holding loads today. Floors remain stiff. Doors stay square. Roof decking resists sag long after iron fasteners have corroded away. This durability was not the result of superior forests or thicker trees alone. Medieval craftsmen understood that wood could be fundamentally strengthened before it ever became part of a structure. They applied a treatment so effective, so repeatable, and so closely guarded within guilds that it rarely entered written records. It was not decorative, and it was not obvious once complete, which is why it vanished from common knowledge. This guide breaks down that method clearly, practically, and without embellishment, because the technique matters as much now as it did then. Why medieval craftsmen knew raw boards were structurally unreliable. Fresh-sawn boards are unstable by nature. Moisture remains trapped inside the fibers. As the board dries unevenly, internal stresses develop. Over time, this leads to cupping, twisting, and loss of strength. Medieval builders worked in climates with long wet seasons, poor ventilation, and constant smoke exposure. If boards were installed untreated, they failed early. Craftsmen observed something critical. Boards exposed to certain liquids, smoke environments, or repeated heating cycles behaved differently. They stiffened. They resisted insects. They cracked less and carried weight more reliably. These effects were not accidental. They were engineered through a strengthening process that altered the wood's internal chemistry. Now, let's talk about how tannin saturation quietly transformed ordinary boards. The most important, and honestly, the least discussed medieval board strengthener was tannin infusion. Tannins, you see, are naturally occurring compounds found in oak bark, chestnut, walnut hulls, and certain leaves. Medieval tanners understood tannins deeply because they used them to convert animal hides into leather. Woodworkers, well, they learned from them. Boards intended for flooring, doors, benches or structural decking were soaked in tannin-rich solutions before installation. Oak bark was boiled for hours to create a dark, acidic liquor. Boards were submerged for days or even weeks, depending on their thickness. This process did three things at once. First, it displaced free water inside the wood. Second, it reacted with lignin and cellulose, stiffening the fiber bonds. And third, it rendered the wood unpalatable to insects and fungi. Once dried, these boards were noticeably heavier, harder, and more resistant to abrasion. The strength increase was not cosmetic, not at all. Tannin-treated boards resisted compression and bending far better than untreated timber of the same size. Why did this method, you might wonder, stay inside guild workshops and not find its way into manuscripts? Well, medieval craftsmen, they protected their practical knowledge quite aggressively. Written manuals were honestly rather rare and intentionally vague. You see, a technique that improved material strength without increasing material cost was a real competitive advantage. Guild apprentices, they learned by observation, repetition and correction, not by reading instructions. Tannin treatment, interestingly, left very few visible clues once it was complete. Unlike charring or carving, it produced no obvious surface marker, apart from a subtle darkening, really. 
That invisibility, in fact, helped the technique fade from historical attention, even as the boards themselves endured. Now, how did heat and smoke complete the strengthening process? After tannin soaking, boards simply were not rushed into use. Instead, they were dried slowly in smoke-filled spaces. Smoke curing, you know, truly mattered. Low heat drove out the remaining moisture, while smoke compounds sealed the surface pores. Phenols and aldehydes in wood smoke, well, they added yet another layer of fungal resistance. Now, this drying phase could take weeks, you know. Boards were carefully stacked with spacers to allow for proper airflow. Craftsmen would keep a close eye on any warping, correcting it while the wood was still, well, pliable. Once everything was set, the boards would hold their shape rather stubbornly. The combination of tannin saturation and smoke curing honestly created boards that behaved more like engineered material than just raw lumber. So, where did medieval builders actually use these strengthened boards? Well, this treatment was really reserved for high-value applications. Door planks, stair treads, floors in great halls, monastery benches, wagon beds, and storage lofts all received tannin-treated boards. These components, after all, needed to endure weight, wear, and moisture all at once. In castles and fortified towns, treated boards were used in hoardings and walkways exposed to rain and sun. Their resistance to rot was critical in defensive structures that could not fail under load. So, how can modern builders and survivalists, you know, apply this knowledge today? The method remains practical with minimal adaptation. To replicate it, begin by sourcing tannin-rich material such as oak bark, acorns or walnut hulls. Boil these materials for several hours until the liquid darkens significantly. Submerge rough-sawn boards fully. Weight them down to prevent floating. Allow them to soak for at least three days for thin boards and up to two weeks for thicker stock. After soaking, remove the boards and allow them to dry slowly in a ventilated shaded space. If possible, expose them to wood smoke from a low-temperature fire. Avoid direct flame or high heat. Rotate boards periodically and correct any early warping by weighting or clamping during drying. These boards are, well, ideal for cabin floors, tool benches, exterior doors, raised storage platforms and load-bearing shelving. The process adds time, of course, but extends service life dramatically. Why this technique explains the endurance of medieval interiors. The survival of medieval wooden interiors is not accidental. Builders understood that strength was created before assembly, not after failure. By altering wood at the cellular level, they reduced maintenance, conserved resources, and ensured reliability in an era where replacement was, you know, costly and slow. This knowledge was quiet, practical, and ruthlessly effective. That is why it lasted for centuries. If this breakdown gave you tools to better understand medieval craftsmanship and apply it in your own projects, subscribe to In the Beginning, share this episode with fellow history and survival enthusiasts, and help preserve the techniques that built the world we inherited.